Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Obi-Wan Kenobi Episode 5, which finally reunites Ewan McGregor and Hayden Christensen in pre-Attack of the Clones flashbacks, which is really great until you realize this is also the face who kills even the younglings. As always, there were so many subtle visual details, deeper layers of meaning, so we gotta break down this episode shot by shot for everything that you might have missed. And a reminder that the best way to support New Rockstars is to get our Empire's Most Wanted shirt over at NewRockstarsMerch.com. Getting one of these gives you the added option to write in a custom shout out that will appear in our Star Wars After Show WikiLeaks. The episode opens back on Coruscant sometime before Attack of the Clones. We know that because Anakin still has the blue lightsaber hilt that he used before it was busted in the Geonosis factory in Attack of the Clones, and he has shorter hair with a Padawan and braid, and yeah, an arm still intact. Also, this is the same exact terrace of the Jedi Temple where we opened episode one of this series, where the first Jedi youngling we saw, our suspicions confirmed this episode, Reva, the third sister. In this case, the shot of the city pulling back from the green hedges is in daytime, contrasting the nighttime of the previous shot. So this flashback is more of a pleasant memory, at least at first, before the darkness set in. The shot from Anakin's perspective has been angled a bit so that different high rises are in frame, now including this one on the far right, 500 Republica, the Senate residence building where, at this point in history, Padme would be living as a young senator from Naboo. When we catch up with Anakin and Obi-Wan in Attack of the Clones, he says he hasn't spoken to Padme since Phantom Menace. So this now tells tells us that he spent all those years longing for his royal dream girl in her tower. This shot echoes his son Luke's future longing as he gazed out upon another horizon. These Skywalker boys, they just love too long. Anakin teases, I was beginning to think you weren't coming. Master, good. Then maybe I stand more of a chance this time. A meaningful exchange. Obi-Wan says that since Anakin could not sense his arrival, late or otherwise, Kenobi's intuition might be more sharply attuned today than his Padawan's is. It also tells us that Anakin might have bested the old man in their more recent sparring sessions. Ewan and Hayden have been de-aged, but just a little bit to remove some wrinkles on their faces, and in Hayden's face to tighten up his chin a little bit. And you can see that artificiality specifically on Hayden's smirk. And that's because mouths, smiles, and talking are just always the hardest for animators who render to be photorealistic. But really, it was just awesome to see these two together again, and I'm glad that they just let the actors act. Obi-Wan circles Anakin, carrying his lightsaber in one hand, Anakin with two hands, inverting the defensive posture Obi-Wan had to take while fighting Vader in Episode 3, Vader in that duel only using one hand. This memory echoes in the mind of Darth Vader as he's on his Star Destroyer, the Devastator. This flashback is interwoven throughout the episode, structuring it as a present lesson that both men are still learning from and having a dialogue with. Vader tells the third sister, Kneel. Grand. Inquisitor. Reva hesitates to kneel in front of Vader because this triggers her back to that moment Anakin towered over her when she was a youngling during Order 66. Roken's freighter returns to Jabim and now we see more of its muddy surface, trails of runoff trickling down into sediment pools. Later, the Grand Inquisitor tells Reva that they are leaving her where they found her in the gutter, and this sinkhole base is literally a muddy runoff gutter. When they land, Leia rushes over to Tala, who's chatting with Corrin and his mother. You remember them, they were the refugees Haja helped escape Escape Dayu in episode two. Now the character Corrin is actually included among the credits of this episode, actor Indy DeRoche, implying that he might be a bit more significant. He could be, or at least be based on, Legends character Corrin Horn, biological son of Jedi Valen Halcyon, whose name actually appears on the wall of this same base and back in the Mapuzo safe house of episode three. According to the Legends continuity, Corrin Horn was born in 18 BBY, which would make this kid the right age. And in those stories, Corrin would go on to be one of Luke Skywalker's first students after the Battle of Endor. Now, these expanded universe stories were classified as no longer canon when Disney took over the franchise in 2015, but many of these stories are still beloved by many folks at Lucasfilm, thus all these Legends details making their way into these Disney Plus shows. All these names from the comics, and in Boba Fett, The Witches of Dathomir, eventually all the best stuff from the EU I think is just gonna be official Star Wars canon anyway. Obi-Wan learns Haja made it off at Dayu and is now wanted by the Empire. Meanwhile, we see a droid with an astromech head and then thick hips. <laughs> passing out food. I'm guessing my man Babu Frick might have made a pair and I am not complaining. <laughs> 
There is another astromech droid that rolls around this base, but this is not R2-D2. R2 was on Alderaan for all of this. Obi-Wan sees the wall that is covered in Jedi markings, all in Orbesh. The Jedi Order sigil in the center, of course, but in the top left, there is no death, a line from the poem of the Jedi Order in which the verse is, there is no death, there is only the Force. Also across the top, big letters, be with you. Beneath it, smaller, may the Force be with you. It seems like people just write that everywhere. To the right of those, directly above the sigil, the name Jin Altis. That's the name of the Altesian Jedi purge survivor from the Legends books like Children of the Force. His name was also on the wall of the Mapuza safe house. In the middle left of screen, large letters, Corwin Shelve. That's another Legends character, actually from the 1993 role-playing game, a character who joined the Jedi Order after the purge. To the right of that, Tiberius, which could be Tiberius Anderlock, who is from the expansion pack to the game from 2003 Star Wars Galaxy's Empire Divided. To the right of that, beneath the sigil, the phrase, the light fades, but it's never forgotten, presumably another message from Quinlan Voss. Above that, to the lower right of the sigil, Valen Halcyon, who I mentioned before, a name also from the Mapuzo safe house, the legend's Corellian Jedi from the X-Wing Rogue Squadron comics. At the bottom, on the far left, there's something falls. Then the bottom middle, the name Roganda Ismarin, another Jedi whose name also appeared in the Mapuzo safe house, an Alderanian Jedi survivor of the Purge, also from the Children of the Force novel. And then on the bottom right, the words only strength. There are also a few initials scattered throughout this wall. In the middle, there's MF, which has got to be Mace F***ing Windu, who also might just say motherfucker. And then to the upper right of the words only strength is EC. Might be Eth Koth if he forgot to spell his last name. Now here, Obi-Wan also finds his crate that is filled with lightsabers. Remember, carrying around a lightsaber at this point is pretty much a death sentence for any Jedi who's trying to hide in society, so it makes sense that they would just give them up like 3D glasses outside of a movie. It makes a bit less sense no one thought to grab one of these to fight off the invading stormtroopers, but oh well. As for which Jedi these lightsabers belong to, probably no one in particular. I was thinking that long, thin one on the far left looks like Maul's or maybe one modded to be a single-bladed lightsaber, but it's not exact. The fourth one from the left has a long ridge to grip like Qui-Gon's did, but again, that's definitely not exact when he put them side by side. Remember, these would not be any of the lightsabers of the Jedi the Empire caught or killed. Those were either burned outside of the temple or put on display in the Fortress Inquisitorius. I checked against Quinlan Boss's lightsaber, Cal Kestis's lightsaber, Caleb Doom's lightsaber, but by the way, that wouldn't make sense because Kanan kept his and Rebels. Some are saying some of these lightsabers looked like the tapered hilts of Addy Gallia's lightsaber or Barriss Offie's lightsaber, but put any of these side by side and they are clearly not matches. I really just think these are all spare anonymous lightsabers and they didn't put any familiar ones in there, but let me know if you recognize any. I think the one interesting detail about this is that Obi-Wan picks up the one lightsaber with the simplest design, clearly the oldest of these, the most scuffed up. That's a saber of a carpenter. I think this is an indicator that there was someone far older than Obi-Wan who made it through this path. Maybe the master who is currently smuggling Grogu to safety. Evil Lola shuts the hangar doors and Obi-Wan tells them Vader is on his way. It's not her, it's Vader. He'll attack next. He has the patience for a siege. And we flash back from Obi-Wan to the memory, proving that this is a memory shared between both Vader and Obi-Wan. The Force is bringing them together to dwell on this particular moment. Here, Obi-Wan instructs, A Jedi's goal is to defend life, not take it. Mercy doesn't defeat an enemy, Master. Yes, Anakin does not think in terms of the sanctity of life, only his present memory and how best to defeat them, which is what makes him so corruptible. The Devastator releases two transports, and we get this great shot of the Devastator as its dagger-shaped hull pierces the planet of Jabim in the background, like a knife cutting into a tomato. One of the Jabim stowaways is actually a cameo by Christina Ariel, host of the Star Wars High Republic show. It seems like this show got a lot of Star Wars influencers to make cameos. Like, what do I gotta do? Don't, don't you love me? No? Okay, fine, I get it. I love how we get this little flash of a Trandoshan family touching their heads together, which is nice because every other time we see Trandoshans are kind of assholes. Over by the back to tank where Obi-Wan spent last episode healing, he reviews Bail Organa's hollow message. I know we said no communication, but your silence worries me learned of the children. If I don't hear from you soon, I'll head to Tatooine. Owen will need help with the boy. I pray you're safe, Obi-Wan. Both of you. Jesus, come on, Bale. Speaking a bit of code, who knows who's gonna find this? The guy really needs to delegate this stuff to a fulcrum agent. Get Ahsoka on the line, please. Tala tells him about her defection after following orders on Garel, slaughtering four families of 14 force sensitive people, six of them children. Garel is actually an outer rim planet in the Lothal sector that shows up a few times in Rebels. Tala reveals a series of notches inside her blaster holster, one for every force sensitive she gets through to safety. And if you count those notches, there are definitely more than 14. I kind of like six 
16 or 17, showing that for Tala, no amount of saved force sensitives will be enough for her. As they gear up for battle, Roken carries a bowcaster with a similar curved bow and knobbed ends as the bowcaster that Chewie carries. Obi-Wan decides to try to negotiate with Reva and he calls out the fact that she knew that Vader was Anakin, something that should have been private information, and he realizes, The Knight of Order 66, you were a youngling. That's how you knew you saw him. And we flash back to that night. The background shows that young Reva and her friends are really at the far end of that raised walkway, the direction they were running in at the end of that scene in episode one. Now we learn that in those doorways on the other end was Anakin cutting them off. One of those kids who gets struck down is actually the same actor who played the youngling in the Amber Stasis in the Fortress last episode, confirming that that was one of Reva's friends and she has to see his young corpse every day. Reva says, I played dead hid with the bodies, felt them go cold. A brief shot shows Reva lying on the ground, her training helmet still wobbling. It's just heartbreaking to see all of this. We see far more of the slaughter here than the Master Anakin kid in Revenge of the Sith, who, by the way, I just learned from an interview with that actor now as a young man. He said that as a kid, he stepped back in fear because Hayden Christensen said boo when they shot that scene. Isn't that sweet? Now, I'm not a skincare aficionado, but I prefer my face to not look like I've been lost in the dunes of Tatooine. I want to take care of the moneymaker. Well, the fine folks at Geology have hooked me up with some skincare products that I have loved. Geology is a nine-time award-winning men's skincare company that creates simple, effective, personalized skincare products for men. So click the link in the video's description and take a 30-second quiz. Tell them about your skin and their team of dermatologists designs a regimen just for you that ships directly to your door. It's great for folks worried about acne, dark eye circles, wrinkles, signs of aging. They send you a 30-day trial set that's easy to incorporate into your routine, whether you're new to skincare or a seasoned expert. Here's what they sent me. Everyday face wash, repairing night cream, vital morning face cream, and some nourishing night cream. So far today, just using this everyday face wash has just made my face feel more comfortable on my head. Like I don't have that awkward like <sighs> that tightness that sets in in the middle of the day. It just feels like my skin is like a nice blanket on my body. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but I'm just like aware of my skin now and it feels nice. Really by designing these things, I love that they do the thinking for me. They send me just what I need and I just have to use it. And they are offering a crazy deal right now. You can get 70% off on their 30 day five piece trial kit. So head to geology.com to get 70% off on your 30 day trial kit when you use the promo code or just click on the link below. That's geology.com promo code rockstars70 to save 70% off on your 30 day trial. But she doesn't want his help and gives the blast doors the Qui-Gon treatment, leading to a shootout where when you notice, stormtroopers are taken down with a single blaster hit, but it takes Obi-Wan three whacks of his lightsaber to take down the more heavily armored purge trooper. Clearly people who worked on the show played Jedi Fallen Order and I appreciate that. Ned B uses the kind of blaster actually used by the battle droids during the Clone Wars. It's awesome to see this guy operate. He throws a stormtrooper up to the ceiling, throws another one 20 feet backward, but Tala and Ned B get hit and Ned B spends his final moment shielding Tala. It is so sad, but it gives her just enough time to activate a thermal detonator and shoot the controls on the door so Obi-Wan's on the other side. May the fools be with you. Now, while of course John Williams gets a lot of praise for his music as he should, Natalie Holt did most of the composing on the show and here you can hear her violin music so heartbreaking, reminding us a lot of the violins that we heard in Loki. And of course the thermal detonator, first named in Return of the Jedi by 3PO in Jabba's palace. Vader meanwhile flashes back again to their sparring session. There's no way out, Master. <laughs> Admit you are beaten. It's over. And because it's a shared memory, Obi-Wan answers to it by saying it's over, as if he is talking to the memory, responding in a kind of dialogue with the memory. And you probably got how back in that memory, Anakin was hacking repeatedly at Obi-Wan's lightsaber, wearing him down as a master knelt, mirroring Luke, hacking at Vader's lightsaber while Vader was kneeling in the same position in Return of the Jedi. Obi-Wan hands over his weapons to Haja. You wanna tell me how you gonna fight without a weapon? There are other ways to fight. Yes, this echoes what he later tells Han Solo in A New Hope as the Death Star beams in the Falcon. You can't win, but there are alternatives to fighting. So Obi-Wan surrenders to Reva, and the shot frames the two of them so that the heavy gun is pointed directly from Reva to Obi-Wan's head. He says, You're not bringing him to me. I am bringing him to you. He offers for them to end it together, and Reva says, What makes you think he won't see it coming? because all you'll see is me. 
Obi-Wan knows in this moment the memory his thoughts are currently dwelling upon is being shared by Vader. So he assumes that since his thoughts are being consumed by Vader, Vader's thoughts are consumed by Obi-Wan. And from here we jump back again to them sparring. There. Your weapon's gone. It's over. Your need for victory, Anakin, it blinds you. Yeah, some of the instrumentation there definitely evoked John Williams' Battle of the Heroes, the staccato horns playing under Anakin's opening charge during their duel on Mustafar. <laughs> You also notice Anakin does that awesome behind the back saber twirl flourish that he uses on Geonosis in Attack of the Clones and while dueling Obi Wan on Mustafar. Lola tries to attack Leia or just like gets in her face, but rather than smashing it like other people would, Leia digs in and finds a restraining bolt under one of its flaps and removes it. Now, of course, restraining bolts are recurring Star Wars tech used to deactivate or control droids. Luke had to remove a restraining bolt from R2 in A New Hope, but because Leia chooses not to smash Lola, she's able to use Lola's light to locate the correct cable. The transport takes off. But Vader drags it back down to the ground, a terrifying amount of strength. We have seen some force sensitive characters do this before, but chronologically, the most recent was Ahsoka trying to keep Maul from escaping in the final episode of Clone Wars before letting him go. Vader tears open the hull, and notice how when we cut to the inside of the ship to see it's empty, these bulkheads all have seats on them. Had people actually been on this ship, sitting in these seats, they would have gone flying. Vader did not care. But as we saw from the beginning of this episode, and now in Vader's entrance to this hangar, there are two freighters. So the refugees wisely fake out Vader with an empty one. Still, if you think about it, someone did have to pilot this. I assume it was that curvy astromech. R.I.P. As Vader watches the real freighter escape, he returns to his memory where Obi-Wan force snatches the lightsaber from his hand. You're a great warrior, Anakin. But you'll need to prove yourself as your undoing. Until you overcome it, a Padawan you will still be. A very interesting counterpoint to the famous exchange in A New Hope. When I left you, I was but the learner. Now I am the master. So, as Vader reflects back on this memory, he accepts that he still has not learned his old master's fuller lesson about his need to prove himself. He's still the learner in that regard. But he has taken away some lessons when it comes to staying a step ahead of his opponent. Because at this point, it would seem like the episode would be over. But, uh, 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 uh. Reva Sneak Attack. This episode was actually co-written by Andrew Stanton, director of Pixar films like Finding Nemo and WALL-E. And one thing that filmmaker is really good at is making heroes pay up right when you think the story is over. Like they can't just learn the lesson mentally, they have to actively prove it in some physical way. For example, even after Marlin finds Nemo, the father has to let his son and Dory tell all the other fish stuck in the net to just keep swimming, risking losing his son again. And then in WALL-E, even after they return the plant to Earth and recharge WALL-E, Eve has to show an act of true love the way Wally did for her when she was cold and soulless. And now for Darth Vader, he must prove he was not blinded by a threat from behind as he was before. So this time he spins around and stops the attack. Actually at first he only uses the force to repel Reva as if she is not even worthy of a lightsaber duel. And in fact you'll notice in this duel he never draws his own blade. He only uses her half. After she ignites that second side of her saber, it actually nearly sears his mask. He slows down the helicopter spin, he snatches it, stabs it in half, tosses as the other one to Reva says, all right, let's do it. As they duel, I love it. Vader hurls a lit blade at her, which she deflects, but Vader uses that one move he learned from his sparring session with Obi-Wan and force snatches the blade to force her to yield. And now Reva is back in that knelt posture, taking her back to her lower position as Vader towered over her when he attacked her during Order 66. The editing even syncs these two moments, the intercutting making it look like younger Reva is reacting to older Vader and older Reva is reacting to younger Anakin. And this is specifically synced when he impales her in the exact same spot that he did before, which actually might explain how she survives this. Whatever cybernetic implants that she got patched with before are now being seared now as opposed to any vital organs. And he says, Did you really believe I did not see it, youngling? And by it, Vader is referring to her hidden grudge against him. Reva assumed Vader didn't remember her, but he totally does. He remembers all the women and the children too. The Inquisitors are all fueled by anger and by vengeance and rage, waiting to take a swing at the big dog. It's not loyalty that keeps them in check. It is fear and vengeance. The Grand Inquisitor struts in alive and well. Revenge does wonders for the will to live, don't you think? He's right. Revenge certainly kept Maul fueled with the will to live after receiving far worse wounds. Also, Powans do have two stomachs, so really it was revenge and having some spare guts to lose. Actually, Rupert Friend hinted at this on Jimmy Kimmel. And then you got stabbed, your character got stabbed. Yeah. Through the, the stomach. One of them. One of the stomachs. Yes. Okay, 
because your character has two stomachs like a, like a hippo or something a like that. A cow, yeah. yeah. They leave her behind in this gutter and Reva regains her split lightsaber and finds Obi-Wan's disc with Bail Organa's message. If you learned of the children, I'll have Tatooine, Owen, help the boy. Now the message is damaged, so Reva probably can't see this is coming from Bail Organa unless she recognizes his voice. But in this moment, she remembers talking to Owen in episode one and is now putting together that Obi-Wan was on Tatooine. He was there protecting the boy who lives under Owen's roof. Now it's unlikely at this point that she knows that the boy is Vader's son specifically. Like she didn't know Leia was Vader's daughter, but she knows this boy is important to Obi-Wan and therefore she now has a way that she can get back to Vader. Obi-Wan assumed this episode that Vader would be so blinded by him that he'd miss the threat from Reva, but Vader saw it coming. Obi-Wan, meanwhile, was so blinded by Vader that he now missed the loose end of his closeness with Reva, exposing his original sacred mission to protect Luke. He senses it, but only too late. Something's wrong. Yes, echoing Obi-Wan, sensing the destruction of Alderaan in A New Hope. I felt a great disturbance in the Force, as if millions of voices suddenly cried out in terror was suddenly silenced. And these final images take us back to where this series started, the Lars homestead on Tatooine. And we see it from the same exact hiding spot where Obi-Wan all the time would spy on it. And the final shot lowers on Luke Skywalker sleeping peacefully in his bed before we cut to black. But what I love about all this is the context of Obi-Wan even visualizing this imagery. Obi-Wan knows that his thoughts are linked with Vader. Obi-Wan can peer into Vader's present mind, Vader can peer into his. So now by even thinking about Luke on the farm, Obi-Wan is risking ceasing Vader on these same thoughts and exposing Luke to danger. The cut to black even feels like Obi-Wan desperately hanging up on this conference call. Now, canonically, Vader is not supposed to know that Luke is on Tatooine. Like, he's not even supposed to know that he has a son or a daughter. Palpatine told him that Padme died in childbirth and lost the kid. And there was an amazing moment in the comic Darth Vader number 6 in 2016, where, after the Battle of Yavin, Boba Fett informs Vader that a rebel pilot named Skywalker fired the kill shot that destroyed the Death Star. And only then does Vader realize, I have the sun and angrily smashes a glass of his observation deck. And that is years from now, obviously. So unless this series wants to retcon that moment, I really hope they don't because it was awesome. It's just unlikely that this finale episode will show Vader discovering Luke on Tatooine, but Reva can certainly know and duel Obi-Wan as she attacks the Lars homestead. Hopefully our man Obi-Wan will get some backup by a babysitter Force Ghost Qui-Gon Jinn with his very particular set of skills to turn Reva into a redemptive character. My hope is that she becomes a great Jedi the way I classify Qui-Gon Jinn to be. That's everything I spotted in episode five of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EA Voss. Follow New Rockstar. Subscribe to New Rockstar for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye.